Hello and welcome to this week. I am so excited to talk to you about Chapter 7, The Group Influences on Consumer Behavior. This is Dr. Greer again, and I am really in love with this chapter. This is right at the precipice of when we go from external to in internal. And so we're going to be talking about groups and the effect groups have on us as we are looking to buy. And this is the section of this book that includes influencers. So I know students usually love this chapter because um, it talks about internet influencers and so I'm hoping you'll like it also. And just gives us a little insight into how that works as a marketing tool <clears throat> and how we can use that influence to market our products. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. This is the last week we're gonna be in the external influences section of this framework. Um, once again, I love the frame. Uh, it's something I use all the time at work. It's not the only framework in the world, but it's a good one to give you a lot of uh, detailed information. And I would just argue once again that if you adapt or adopt, excuse me, if you adopt a framework that you can use in your marketing as you move forward in your career, you're going to be so far ahead of of the majority of the marketing industry. And I think that one of the little known secrets is that the people who are creative and do amazing marketing campaigns typically work within a framework. They don't just make stuff up. They don't have, they're not just coming up with ideas. They're coming up with ideas within a structure because the structure is what gives you power. And so um, I, I really just want to keep hitting this home every week that if you're really serious about wanting to get into marketing, I would learn a framework something like this now let's say you go to a job and at that job they tell you oh no no we're not going to use this that's great you don't have to get everybody to use it but you individually if you can be going through these pieces as you're developing marketing materials you are going to look a million times smarter because you're already getting all these check boxes off of things that you need to be looking for now i had an interesting question last week in class and i just wanted to address it really quickly before we go on to this whole thing which is, it seems like there's so much information. Can you really do this on every marketing campaign? And the answer is no, you can't. But, <laughs> this is a big but, in this book, one of the reasons I love this book is there are so many uh, worksheets that allow you to take this, like right now we're learning these concepts. <clears throat> so together you and I are talking about this, we're experiencing what it is, and this is what your profession is probably gonna be. And so it's a, it's a good time to put this all, all this knowledge into your brain and, and to have good information to draw from, okay? So you're building your own toolbox in your mind, as I would say right now. So you're saying, okay, maybe I do need to look at the culture or the subculture. Um, what would the demographics do for me on this one? Uh, what's the social status that I'm trying to aim for? What are some reference groups or, or the family or what are some marketing activities I could do? These are all external influences. Now we haven't even gotten into the internal influences yet. <clears throat> but what you get is a quick checklist of a way to go down a list of things to do to just make sure that you have someone that you're talking to, uh, that you understand that person, that you have created a marketing campaign that will speak to at least a group of people not everyone because as i've said from day one when you speak to everyone you speak to no one so you just need to be very clear about that and i think that's what's really powerful about this information so i wouldn't be blowing this off if i were you i wouldn't be thinking oh another week on external influences every piece of this is valuable because each one of these can have a different impact now i am also going to say this is not all there is to consumer behavior with marketing this is a class and you will learn a lot more in your lifetime as you go through your, your career. However, you will learn much faster, in my opinion. You will exponentially increase your growth rate in your career if you have something like a framework that you're working from to kind of influence your decisions and help you make good processes in your mind. So that's what this is. <clears throat> and uh, I had that question last week, so I just wanted to make sure I, I give this to you um, so that you understand that also. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and jump into chapter seven here. We're gonna be talking about reference groups and how we classify them. Then we're gonna talk about consumption subcultures or um, brands and online communities. Then we're gonna go through the different types and degrees of reference group influence. Jumping after that into uh, discuss within group communication. So how do those reference groups talk to each other? 
and why mouth-to-mouth -mouth and um, communication is so important for us. Then we want to move into understanding opinion leaders. These are both online, like influencers, and offline, which I would say are offline influencers, and why they're important to their market. And finally, we're going to talk about innovation diffusion and how that helps some brands continuously push the envelope and keep their group in in a great little um, subculture, I would say, or a subgroup <clears throat> of how they keep them engaged in the brand. So let's go, let's go ahead and jump into it. So what is a reference group? Uh, a group is defined as two or more individuals who share a set of norms, values, or beliefs and have a certain implicitly or ex explicitly defined relationships to one another, such as their behaviors are interdependent. Now, that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but actually it's a very uh, astute observation, I would say. So if I was to tell you that um, you were a UVU student and you know, that that's a group, you know, you're, you've got a shared set of norms, like, okay, what buildings are you going to be meeting in? What are you expected to do? How do you complete homework? Now, if I moved it into a reference group, is a group whose presumed perspectives and, or values are being used by an individual as the basis for his or her current behavior. If I was to say I was a gamer, a student gamer, right? So like we can, we can pull these things down farther and farther. Or if I was to say that, um, I'm an Instagram boyfriend, right? Like little things like that. Like, okay, now there'd be a presumption that as an Instagram boyfriend, I'm gonna go around and take pictures for my um, significant other, and I'm gonna make sure that I'm always there doing that stuff for him or her. Um, <clears throat> so these are the two little groups that we'll be talking about. And there's four criteria that are really useful when classifying groups. The first one is membership. You have to be part of the club. Uh, number two is the strength of the social tie. And then three is the type of contact and four is the attraction. Now, I just wanna give you an example. Um, I have owned several different cars in my life. <laughs> and um, I like to have a hobby car, typically. So at one point I had a Datsun Roadster. And it's an old car uh, made in the 60s and 70s. And it's a really cool little convertible. And I love that car. It was fantastic and I loved the group in fact the car club that I was part of was so fun to be part of they were just a great group of guys everybody was always in a happy mood I think it's because we're always driving convertibles around and we just had such a good chemistry I would say it was a lot of fun to be a member of that group now flash forward I got rid of that car and I bought a Volvo 122s which is a 1964 car and it was a four-door black uh, Volvo 122S. And I love that car also. And I got more honks when I was driving that car around. So it was like, it was an iconic car because even when I was driving it home from uh, rescuing it from the desert, it was, one wheel was wobbling. It was just a really bad situation. But I, I literally got honks the entire way. People give me thumbs up and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And I didn't realize how, um, how, powerful a draw to like a car club could be till then. Now, I love that car and I drove that car for a long time, had a great time with it, um, went to a lot of uh, Volvo events, but I gotta be honest, that group of guys was not as, and gals, it wasn't as fun. I didn't l enjoy that group as much as I liked the Datsun Roadster group. So it's just an interesting you know, anecdote of my life of being part of a club just because I owned something. All right. Have you ever seen somebody that has your shoes on and you're like, hey, yeah, here we go, we're together. You know, like, um, or maybe someone that has your phone, something like that. Like, there's a connection that's made when we uh, when we have these things. So it's just important. Um, so the type of groups can uh, when we have consumption subcultures, there's an identifiable hierarchy, and that hierarchy, like when I was in the Dotson Club. Um, one guy had done an engine swap and he just made the most beautiful machine and it had a new motor in it, like a new motor, not like the old version of the motor, but a brand new, uh, well, it was a, like a 90s motor in it. Beautiful vehicle. Obviously, he was king of the hill. He was like the alpha male. Um, but it didn't matter that 
that hierarchy was there because we had a shared set of beliefs and values, which was, hey, we're all about making sure everybody had what they needed for their, there was a great group of people trying to just make sure everybody had um, the tools that they needed or the parts they needed. And we would have jargon and rituals. Like we would all go up to certain car shows. There was a, um, there still is a, a drive that you go up to Solvang in California and all the Datsun guys would drive up there and we'd take over this little Dutch town. And it was, it was just a lot of fun. And so there are different things that each group of people do. Um, I would also say like when I played Call of Duty, I used to be pretty into Call of Duty and um, I had a clan and we would play and I, there was a hierarchy of who was the top person in the clan because you'd have the best kill to death ratio and then we could call out in fact a funny story uh one time i was talking to a friend of mine on xbox live and my wife and i had a deal that i would never talk about my personal life or my children and so um, i'm playing with this guy that i've been playing with on xbox live for eight years never met him in real life but he actually knew my brother-in-law and one night we're just talking his, and uh, we were using our gamer tags. And I just switched over to his real name. I'm like, hey, Mike, I, I didn't know. Like, tell me about yourself. Do you have any kids? And so we just start having this conversation. We're in our private chat. And my wife got really mad. She started throwing pillows at me across the room. And uh, afterwards, I, I got in kind of an argument with my wife. I'm like, what are, you, what are you mad about? Like, this is fine. Like, Mike and I have known each other for like eight years. She's like, it's not just him. You talk to other people all the time. And, and I was like, I don't talk. I've never said anything online. To anybody about my children unless it was like somebody I knew personally or this was the first person that was kind of like outside of that circle but we had been playing so much together and she's like oh you always talk to Charlie and I'm like what and she I was like who's Charlie I've never said Charlie she's like you're always over there Charlie this Charlie that <laughs> and I started laughing because I was referencing points like the C on a map <laughs> so there's an A, B, and a C on certain video game maps and I would say go Charlie go Charlie that was me kind of directing my group where to go and then I said I also say go alpha and go beta <laughs> so um, it was just a funny moment where I was using jargon that my wife didn't understand she thought I was talking to somebody <laughs> cheering them on cheering them on obviously when I was saying go Charlie but that's one of my, my favorite examples of jargon being used by a group of people. Um, so <clears throat> we have brand communities and they can really make you feel good about a purchase. In fact, I think it can build incredible loyalty to a product depending on what gets wrapped around it. And when you become part of a brand community, it it typically means you're gonna keep using a brand or you're gonna do CrossFit or you're gonna get into American Ninja Warriors, you're gonna do Ninja Gyms. I, I think that it's fascinating to me to see how quickly we'll gravitate towards, you know, if we buy guns, then we're in a gun group that likes to go shoot or if we like to fish. Um, you know, we, we build these communities and in fact, um, cyclists, a lot of times, they all have different bikes, but if you have a group of people that have, you know, a certain type of bike, they'll gravitate towards each other. And so there's not just the biker community or the bicyclist, the cyclist community, but there's the brand of bike. Harley Davidson is a great example of motorcycles. Very loyal brand, you're gonna always buy one of those. So I just wanna show this quick video about Mini Cooper and using marketing brand um, to create and generate some buzz. It's, a, it's not too long and it's a little old, but it's okay because they have some good information on here. Let's go ahead and watch this. The Threefold Challenge is this. We're launching a completely new automotive brand. We're launching an entirely new segment because Mini is the smallest car on the American road. And third, we were launching two models. The traditional approach to launching an automotive brand wasn't going to work. We knew we had to think differently. The Mini team set out to create an integrated message that would appeal to its customers. We created our own culture of driving, really, and we call it motoring. So one of the first things we did was publish a little book called The Book of Motoring. And we distributed over 300,000 of these via requests on the website, auto shows, events, really to explain this culture. And what this culture is all about, it's about volunteering jumper cables. It's about more than going from A to Z, um, but it's everything in between. It's all about smiles, because a mini makes you smile when you're driving, when you're motoring in it, rather, but it also makes other people smile. It's about taking the long cut rather than the short cut. So for example, we have lines such as, once you've had small, you'll never go back. The SUV backlash officially starts now. And let's sip, not guzzle. 
Publicity has proved to be a most effective tool for promoting many. The news and auto media have been inundated with articles and awards regarding the safety, reliability, and ultimate value of the Mini. It truly, for Mini, has been one of the most powerful communication tools we had because the PR was so extensive and so in-depth and truly magnificent, and it really opened the door and allowed us to do some very unique and different non-traditional approach marketing. The typical car salesperson title did not quite seem right for Mini, so instead we coined the term Mini Motoring Advisor. We invested very heavily in the training of these motoring advisors to create the ultimate brand experience for the consumer. Yet again, one of those all-important consumer touch points. Welcome to Prestige Mini. My name is Augie Frager. I'm the sales manager uh, at Mini. I think it's a little bit different than your average uh, car dealership. And marketing is completely different from what people are used to. This was a scavenger hunt that we had in the fall. And we had different clues to different points that you try to meet. And if you were successful enough to meet at all these points, you, you got a piece of the puzzle. And whoever had the most pieces of the puzzle that meant at the final destination and put it into the giant puzzle, which created the classic mini at the end, um, got a prize. It was at an old apple orchard in upstate New York. The Mini Motoring Advisors truly act as an extension of the Mini brand when it comes to the customer retail experience. Mini has successfully built a marketing communication system which listens to all groups within the organization, responds quickly to customer feedback and information, and uses their marketing messages to let their customers know they are listening and responding to their needs. A rare opportunity presented itself when uh, we were asked to launch the Mini. Kind of reinvent automotive history. And consumers, as we noted earlier, had virtually 0% brand awareness. Uh, people were unsure whether it would be successful or not. So we truly got to build the brand from the bottom up. We ended up winning the North American Car of the Year, and we're the first European vehicle ever to do that, and we did it with the Mini. All right, so that was you know pretty in-depth uh, setup that they had there, a bunch of stuff. Uh, all wrapped up into one marketing campaign. I think that's a good example of them trying to establish a brand identity and to create a sense of community. So let's jump into types of groups. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk about some online communities and some social networks. So the community interacts around a topic of interest on the internet. And I don't know if you've been in a forum, those were pretty old school, or you have someone you follow on Instagram or on Facebook that um, is into something specific that you're into. <clears throat> but this is a good group, like a good example of an online community. Now, we can use these to do marketing. And I just wanna throw a big caution, warning up there really fast. Um, I deal with students all the time who get hired as social media marketing people for different little companies. And it's because the old fogies feel like they don't understand TikTok or Instagram and they just need someone to get their Instagram followers up. And I think that these three rules are very important and I've had personal experience. So I, I ran a business that was completely fueled by social media um, leads coming in. <clears throat> and I think that what's really important in social media is to realize that none of us wants to be uh, manipulated and advertised to when we're in the middle of our social media feeds. <laughs> so I think a lot of times we'll sit there and we'll scan through a bunch of spam. We're like, oh, why is everybody sending this spam? Then we'll go to work and we'll write up a spam email essentially, which is a marketing ad, a message that goes out to somebody and we're doing exactly what we don't want to have done to ourselves. So it's very difficult and very simple at the same time. But I think that one of the biggest things you need to do is just realize that if you're going to market, be transparent about your marketing, okay? It's gonna instantly turn off eyeballs. But it's way more effective if you can be part of the community. So what I did originally was, there was a forum for my online business that I had that I got on for three months and I participated in the forum. I didn't ask for one thing. I, I didn't hype my business, I didn't do anything. I just participated and gave to the community to the point where I started to have some pretty good social cred 
with that group and people started asking me like how do you know about all this like what do you do exactly and i started telling them and that started the avenue of advertising but but keep in mind like they asked me i didn't volunteer the information and once i got known for what i was doing then it was a lot easier to talk about it because everybody knew oh the reason that he's an expert on this is because of the business that he has and so i was able to take advantage of the unique capabilities of that venue of that forum and i got tons of of uh, business off of that forum just because people saw me as the expert that i had become so i think it's very important that if you're starting to use social media you should not i repeat you should not come out and just advertise and market because it's the fastest way to turn people off in fact i see companies all the time that are like you know you go to a plumbing store they're like follow us on instagram i'm like why would i ever follow a plumbing store on instagram like i have zero interest in that much less like what are they going to do for me i know it's just going to be a stream of advertisements um i love i love the um the restaurant mobetas and i went into mobetas the other day and mobetas wanted me to give them my phone number and they'd give me a five dollar coupon and everybody in, uh, that I work with that was there with me was like, oh, this is a great deal. It's so cheap. And I'm like, you guys, we're in the marketing department. You know what they're going to do with this? They're going to start spamming your phone with a bunch of text messages that you don't want. And then your phone's going to get, your phone number's going to get put into a database that they're going to sell probably to make some money. And then you're going to start getting your, your phone numbers no longer your own. You know, it's, it's something that's not available to you. That's how bad things have gotten. And I'm not saying anything bad about Mobetas. I'm just saying that's what typically the uninformed marketer does is that we just inundate and inundate people with stuff because we don't realize that that can have a very big negative perception to them. So I think it's super important when you want to get out there on social media that you have to do what's right for the other person, not what you want. And I promise you, because I've seen this so many times, if you forget about what you're trying to accomplish and you give to the community, they will give back to you in what you're looking for if, you, if you're doing it in the right way. So um, I have just seen that so many times in my career be a very effective way. Um, in my last uh, company that I was at, Pearson, we did a massive marketing campaign based around educators. And we were trying to get these certification programs out there. And so I went to a conference and they wanted to have a big social media push. And so they wanted everybody to, to tweet out or to... Uh, Facebook post this Microsoft certification that we had, <clears throat> the MTA. And so I actually sat down and really, really thought through this whole thing. And I, I came away and I told my, uh, my field marketing person that was with me, I said, okay, listen, we can do this, but it's going to take effort and we're going to have to be on and we're going to have to go for it. So what we ended up doing was we went out and we went to a conference. We had a free where where professors and high school teachers could come and take their certification for free. They could come and get it. Normally it was like 150 bucks. So we were packed. Everybody was coming. And what would happen was inevitably some people wouldn't pass, but a lot of people, because they were teaching in the field, they could pass these exams. And so they would get their certification. Well, instead of just getting their certification, asking them, hey, will you tweet out and tell us that you love us or you know, put it on Facebook, we post this. What I did instantly was I had them come over and I took their picture and with a high quality camera, we had a backdrop. And then um, I would interview them on a video because they were on a high, they had just one. Oh, and that's the other thing. I wanted it to feel special. So we bought a brand new high quality laser printer, brought some really thick cardstock. Um, we had these little envelopes that we would frame um, in a little paper frame, their certificate. We wanted it to be super special. And we would give them a t-shirt that had the Microsoft technology thing on it if they would pass their certification. So we had all these things that we were giving to them. Well, we would come over and I had seven questions lined out and I would just ask them. And they gave the most incredible testimonials because they had just experienced it. And then what I did was I would post that on our Facebook feed. And then I would, um, I asked everybody for their Facebook ID and so then I would send it to them say hey look we're featuring you on the Facebook feed well it came back after that weekend and it was a lot of work I'm, I'm you know it wasn't like I could just like get done at the end of the day and be done like I would go back to my hotel room every night and I would be editing photos or editing because we would put a little watermark on there um, I just passed my Microsoft technology associate 
and um, you know people would have their thumbs up. They were wearing their Microsoft shirts and everything it was wonderful. But we did more social media um, impressions and, and context uh, touch points in one weekend than they had done in the previous year. And so when we came back to the office, everybody was like, how did you do that? And my answer was simple. It was just like, I was serving a group of people that I knew needed the product. And, and so that's just, you need to be thinking that way. Like if, if I could give someone, and so there was, let me just break that down a little bit. First, I was giving them a free test. Second, I was providing them the lab that they could do it in with all the encouragement that they needed. Third, um, when we, we, so we had to bring all the equipment. It was an expensive adventure for us, but I think it paid off handily because all these people had experienced it. Third, when they got their certificate, no one in the marketing department, I had been fortunate enough to administer these before. No one had ever done that where they, um, they had handed someone the certificate. And I told them, you know what happens when you hand someone one of these certificates? That, like everything changes. Their their facial facial expression changes. You can tell they have confidence. And um, and then fourth, I didn't just hand them a certificate, but I gave them an easy way to do what I needed, which was I gave them a congratulations, and it was so simple for them to just brag about it and push that out and it went like wildfire in a couple areas it was really great i had one teacher she passed and she just had a huge social media network and it just trickled all over so we had all this great stuff um it was so great in fact before i left microsoft was talking about traveling around the country and doing that in their stores because it was just a great social media piece that we could we could have so once again, though, I was thinking of the group. It was a bunch of educators who are usually cash strapped. I gave them the opportunity. I had somebody come in and I think get six or seven cert certifications that weekend. And um, I, oh, another thing was the state of Arkansas had sent a bunch of their educators. And they had all come in and tried to pass it. In fact, there were more people from Arkansas that got the our certifications that weekend than anything else. So the last day I knew Arkansas was having a big breakfast because I had seen so many of them. And I asked the head person if I could come in and give a quick presentation to them. I said, I'll only take two minutes, but I wanted to present your team with something. He was kind of like, okay. So I had to race back uh, to my hotel that night. I created a, um, a certificate, not uh, an award for them. And I, I gave it to them. And it was an award for that group to realize that they had to earn the most certifications of any state. And... Um, I called you know headquarters and said, is it okay if I present this award? And they were thrilled. They said, that's great. And and so it got featured on the Arkansas education page and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was it was me serving them, if that makes sense. I, I wasn't trying to tell them, hey, you have to advertise this for no, I was giving them something that they wanted, which was validation for coming to this conference. So anyway, um, there's lots of great examples of stuff like that that you can do, but it's it's a pretty neat experience when you can hit a marketing campaign that just fires on all cylinders. So um, when we're looking at different reference groups, there are uh, ways that they can influence the consumption process. So if you're in a Harley Davidson group and, and you wanna go buy a Kawasaki, you're, you're not gonna get out of that brand. You know They've locked you pretty well into that um, because they wanna make sure that you're getting that. If you are buying a high-end watch or a luxury car you know that's a product class influence it's like okay is this in the group that i want it to be in so there's those different little things to think about when you're doing that so when when we look at the different kinds of influences that we have reference groups typically have three types of influence informational influence aka i know way more about this than you do so i can help you learn about this normative influence or utilitarian like do we use this together or identification influence, like this says something about me. And my wife loves her hunter boots, okay? Uh, if you don't know what hunter boots are, I'd go look them up, but they're a really expensive, kind of like plasticky boot. Um, she has bright red ones and they have a special little logo on them. And I remember when she got them, all she, she had a friend give them to her and she wanted the socks that went with them. They have these $70 socks that go with these $250 boots. So I got them for her. And she just wears them all the time. She just loves them. Well, I know that if I see somebody with hunter boots, you should try this. If you see some hunter boots, say, nice boots. I love those. And they just smile instantly because they know they're part of a group of hunter boots. So 
Um, there's different types of consumption situations that reference groups have influence on. So if it's visible usage, like hunter boots, like you can see them really well, or high relevance uh, of product to the group. So you know, um, I, I usually like to say like, Apple people stick together. <laughs> um, low individual purchase confidence. So if you don't know much about the product, I would say a lot of times mattresses is one of those. Then you, you look for influencers to give you information on that. Uh, strong individual commitment to the group. It's like if I am um, for breast cancer awareness, so we're gonna go do a fun run or whatever, like I'm gonna commit. Or a non-necessity item, which means this is something that I don't need, but I'm gonna do a lot of research to make sure I get the right thing. And I have a couple of examples of that coming up. So I'm gonna just jump down to the things that we probably don't need. Uh, the private and non-necessity, this is different uh, situation characteristics. But if we're looking at like a hot tub, I don't have to buy a hot tub. Um, I bought a massage chair. I personally have a massage chair. Did a ton of research on a massage chair. Now, is that something I need to do that much? Well, you know, you go to Costco and get one or you can go to a, a, a massage chair website. But I mean, I can't tell you, I probably did 50 hours of research before I bought the one I bought. And um, whereas when we go to visible necessities like shoes, some people might just go to Payless. Other people might go to Nike. And you know, why would you go to Nike over Payless? Well, some people might tell you quality. I would argue that they're trying to identify with the brand. And so there's just different groups that happen and we have a lot of those different pieces of influence. So once you're in a group, there's different types of communications. So first is word of mouth. Um, when you're in a group, you can really influence the rest of the group if you say, hey, I like blank. Have you ever bought one of these? And instantly that conversation starts happening throughout the whole group. It's pretty fun to watch. Or there might be a person in the group who's an opinion leader. Uh, opinion leaders are people that have a high level of information and trust with that group. So they could just, they could come out and say, you know what, everybody should be buying a blue one of these. And the next day you're gonna see tons of people with the blue ones. And cause they're gonna say, oh, well the, this opinion leader told me that. Um, and those are also, I think what we could call influencers at this point. There might not be, um, an influencer differs from an opinion leader because they might not be um, an expert in, I'll just say Kim Kardashian. You know, she might not be an expert in anything, but anything she touches typically is going to get purchased a lot because the people that follow her and trust her style or her choices that she makes. And then we might also have some uh, marketing or online strategies targeted at that group of people. So these are all, you know, four different ways that we can do that. And when we look at uh, word of mouth versus advertising, so the percentage of people uh, who put people versus advertising as its best source. So when we look at restaurants, I think of this as Yelp. Um, if you go to Yelp, I'm a big Yelper, I like Yelp. And because it's typically other people uh, reviewing versus an ad that I've read. So 83% of people trust people on restaurant recommendations and only 35% trust advertising. So we can see that one of the ones that's a little different than that is movies. Movies has an inverse re, uh, relationship there where advertising typically helps someone uh, trust that a little bit more than word of mouth. But I'd say Rotten Tomatoes is a great example of, have you ever seen a Rotten Tomatoes where the critics gave it a really low score, but the audience gives it a high score? Or the critics give it a high score, and the audience gives it a low score? I think those are really fun because you get to see this kind of in action almost as it goes. Now that would be opinion leaders versus just people giving you their, you know, their word of mouth, but I think it's an interesting way to look at these different pieces here. Um, the bottom on their websites to visit, have you ever had so many have you, well, how about this? I see advertisements all the time on TV for, for websites, different things that which never go. But if someone tells me, hey, have you ever been seeing this? This is a great website. Probably look it up right then on my phone. So that's a, just a, another good way to uh, see how that works. So an opinion leader is the go-to person for specific types of information. This person filters, interprets, and passes along information. And so, uh, during the purchase period, when someone's trying to get knowledge and expertise, opinion leaders typically, um, they're in a group, a specific category, and they have one thing that, like photography, like which camera to buy is a great example. A lot of people gravitate towards online experts or influencers for that. So an opinion leader is the go-to person for that specific type of information. 
and, and that's pretty good. In fact, in one of my previous classes, we did a, a different type of report and they had to do something like this. And one of the students did a report on mattresses. And it was in the first couple of weeks of the class. For the rest of the class, if someone was going to be buying a mattress, they would come in and ask that person, hey, did, did you research this mattress? He became the opinion leader on mattresses in the class, which was kind of fun to watch. Um, so when we're looking at how communication within groups happens and within opinion leadership, so we have a direct flow, which is marketing activities, go straight into the relevant marketing segments, or we have a multi-step flow where the marketing activities kind of go after or go to influence the opinion leader, and the opinion leader then influences back and forth with the market segment. So there's, there's different ways of doing that. <clears throat> We've kind of seen a version of this a couple slides back, but this is just one of those um, really effective charts, I would say, that's in this book that shows us kind of how we would look at um, who's going to get word of mouth and opinion leadership. So if you see that if, it's, if the product purchase involvement is high, that means you're going to have a high level of getting involved with it. But the product knowledge is low. That's the most likelihood of someone looking for word of mouth or an opinion leadership. So there's just those four quadrants, and I would just keep that in mind. Um, crowdsourcing is also another cool thing. It goes well beyond consumer-generated ads. This means that you can get a bunch of people involved in, in trying to come up with something. In fact, um, just an interesting anecdote here at doTERRA, we, we provide a lot of materials for our distributors to go out and use. And one of the things we were trying to do is get a bunch of different looks and feels. So we actually have opened up to like a contest kind of thing where it's a crowdsource and it's for us to be able to get more effective ads or marketing materials for people to use. So it, it can work if you do it right. Um, and then the book talks about this as Maven's Influentials and Effluentials. But I just want to say that like in the last 10 years since this book is done, I think this is more what we would call an influencer now. Now you need to know these terms because they're on the test. But um, yeah, I always say that influencers have really become a big piece of advertising and marketing because we can see that instead of trying to reach each person, we can reach one and that person can reach out to their group and have a pretty um, incredible effect or negative effect if, if we don't do it right. So, um, yeah, some of these things, a lot of times we'll send samples out as marketers or we can have some um, personal selling. There's a great um, video on YouTube if you want to look it up that talks about Payless going to the um, LA fashion show, I think is what it was. And they renamed this, they put a pop-up store and people were, all these influencers were coming in paying $600 for a pair of boots. And then at the end they would show them, they'd be like, well, technically we're actually pay less because I think it was pay less is what they had, they put like an Italian name on it. And uh, they gave everybody their money back, made them look kind of stupid, um, which was, I would say it was a, it was a very um, potentially dangerous one to do because people were like on their uh, blogs and they were talking about video blogs and stuff like that saying oh I'm here these are the most incredibly comfortable shoes I would say easily this is a $250 shoe and I'm getting it for 190 or something like that and and uh, so it was it was pretty fun to watch but go ahead and look up Payless Shoe Source and the LA um, the LA Fashion Week it's it's a good video online so uh, you know sometimes advertising can stimulate or simulate word of mouth and opinion leadership by just showing like hey this person is drinking this um, I think that you know that's a really good way. If you ever watch any kind of um, NASCAR or um, racing, F1 racing, they always have certain sunglasses on, or they're drinking a certain drink. Um, they're always really thirsty on like motocross. They're always drinking out of the Red Bull or Monster Energy drink. It, it's pretty funny to watch. And that's not because they're trying to hydrate. That's because they're advertising, letting people see that. Um, so I, I think that when we look at different strategies for online. Um, it's interesting because a lot of times, we're, I would say blogs and Twitter are now more Instagram and Facebook, right? Um, there's still a good reason to have blogs. It's good for SEO. And Twitter is a great thing, but once again, these are all, um, you need to be serving the community. I think that's the hardest part to just have everybody remember is that viral marketing, it's very hard to say this is gonna go viral. Um, you can take some shots at it, but I think a lot of times people think that they need to be funny 
when when what they need to be is effective and it's what does the group want that you're talking to so just i can't hammer that home enough now innovation uh, let's just jump into innovation really quick here before we wrap this up because we're getting really close to the end um, innovation is an idea practice or product perceived to be new by the relevant individual or group um, i don't love this example that they have here, but I would say Nike is a great example of like every year, year and a half, they come up with a new sole or new technology that they're always implementing into their shoes. Um, when they do this, it's pushing innovation. And there is a group of people that wanna be the forefront. They wanna be the pioneers. And then there's a group that wants a little bit more security. They wanna be the settlers that come in after the pioneers. And then there's a group that doesn't want to make any bad decisions. They're like the sheep at the end of that. And so we want to make sure that um, in order to keep a buzz about stuff, we do want to have an innovation um, kind of track for a group of people that are our pioneers. And they're usually our raving fans. So um, it can affect how, how much it gets adopted. So let's just go through these categories of, of innovations here really quick. So continuous innovation, dynamically continuous innovation, and discontinuous innovation. So continuous innovation is like that Nike thing where adoption of this type of innovation requires relatively minor changes in behavior and are unimportant to the consumer. So like I can, I can get that new shoe um, like uh, Epic Reacts or a Zoom and it does what I want it to, you know, either one's like a running shoe, but it doesn't require that I make massive changes i can just buy the product a dynamically continuous innovation is an adoption of this type of innovation requires a moderate change to an important behavior or major change in a behavior of low or moderate importance to the individual um I'm trying to think of a good example that i can give you but let's just say um oh i have some good examples that are being enforced by law but i'm trying to think of something that we would do um, this is just something that would affect you, but you'd be willing to do it in order to innovate. Um, and I'd probably say a good one of these would be like a water bottle company, you know, trying to get you to not drink out of a plastic water bottle, but getting a hydro flask. It's probably a good way to look at that was probably a good, uh, dynamic dynamically continuous innovation and then discontinuous innovation adoption of this type of innovation requires major changes in behavior of significant importance to the individual or group. Um, let's say you want someone to drive an electric car. So they're no longer going to go to the gas station. It's a big change. And going to the gas station was a big deal because that was your car. So that might be something I would say is a discontinuous innovation. But as we look at how we spread out or diffuse innovations, the adoption process goes through in uh, different phases. So, or different stages. So someone gets aware, then they get some interest, then they decide I'm gonna evaluate it, and then they go through a trial of it, and then they adopt it. Each one of those um, steps is extended, at, like awareness is problem recognition. Like, oh, I do have a problem. Interest is information search. I'm gonna go look for it. Evaluation is, is there a different thing? When I, when I bought my electric car, I had a Nissan Leaf, I did all of this. I was like, you know what? Maybe I could get away with not driving, um, paying for gas. And I did, I did this whole list of things while I was doing that. So um, typically, when we look at diffusion rates for different types of technology, here's just a, um, you know, how quickly everything got adopted. You can see that radio kind of was slower, TV jumped up, cable took a while, but hit its stride, VHS tapes, which was there, um, was going up, DVDs, spiking and dropping at this point. Um, digital video recorders down there at the bottom right, it's really low. I was one of the first people to have a TiVo and I was telling everybody like, I can't believe you don't have a TiVo, like these things are amazing. Um, so it's just interesting to see when things, I remember, um, I don't know if I've told you this, but my mom resisted getting an iPhone forever and I told her like, you are the person that the iPhone was invented for. As soon as she went in, she was all in, but it took her quite a bit of time before she went from her little, uh, like LG or Samsung slider phone. It was a, it was a, it was a sad day. <laughs> All right. And then um, different types of factors that can affect the spread of innovation. We can have what kind of group it is, who makes the decision. Is it risky? Um, 
you know, should I put solar panels on my house? There's a group of people that want to, should I build a dome home? There's all these different types of innovation that happen. We can look at all these different rates uh, or ways that we can get that spread to go. And this is kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier before where we have innovators and early adopters, which I would say are the uh, pioneers. They're the people going out and they're gonna get um, cut a little bit, maybe bleed a little bit because they'll get hit by the tech, but they're, or not just the tech, but the innovation, but they're willing to take that risk. And then we have the late majority and the early majority, which are kind of like the settlers and then the laggards are the sheep. They're the people that just kind of do it once it's there and it's the only thing to do. So that's chapter seven. I hope we've had a good time today. I've really enjoyed talking with you. And um, please, I hope you take this uh, advice and their information I'm giving you to heart because I know you could be an incredible marketer with it. I'm so excited to see what you're gonna do this week with your, uh, with your assignments. And I will talk to you later. Thank you very much.